After tireless scripting, recording and editing, I've finally finished my most ambitious video yet, which is about my top 10 favorite video game franchises, and I couldn't be happier to share it with you all. I've been looking forward to this day since even before the channel's creation, as I've had something like this in mind for almost a decade. I wanted to wait some years before revealing my favorites, so there would be some mystery to my opinions, but as is evident by a lot of my videos, I haven't quite been able to keep that mystery, so my followers could probably predict some of my picks. That's why I thought it would be a cool idea to have a guessing contest beforehand, so all those times I've gushed about a video game series can be treated like hints leading up to that contest. Some of them haven't been very subtle, but others could have been easily missed since I barely mentioned them. And some of the franchises I've covered in depth aren't necessarily my absolute favorites. Last week was my birthday, so you might be wondering why I didn't release this special video back then, or even February 29th for that matter, as that was my first slash fourth anniversary. Those used to be the viable dates I had planned to release this video on, but today is a special day too, and I'll explain why that is later on during the countdown. After having revealed my favorite video game franchises, I'll be more open about them, as well as other games I love, which means I'll be making some videos I wouldn't have made up until this point. That's especially the case for whatever ends up being number one on my list, so please stick around after the countdown is over, as I'll talk a bit more about the future of this channel, and I'll of course announce the winner of the guessing contest as well. Before I start, here are some ground rules for the countdown. I only count franchises with at least two games, and of course, I must have played at least two games from a franchise for it to count. So singular IPs like A Hat in Time, Horizon Zero Dawn and Sunset Overdrive couldn't make the list unfortunately. They do have DLC and other extra content, but I still view each of them as one game. A dual game series like Banjo-Kazooie doesn't count either, as I haven't played both. With that out of the way, I hope you all enjoy this video as much as I enjoyed making it. I'll be honest, while I'm quite certain about my ranking of numbers 5 through 1, it was very hard for me to rank 10 through 6, for various reasons I'll get into. The ranking could very well change on a dime, but this is what I ended up with for now, and starting the countdown at number 10 is Pokemon. This franchise has had a huge impact on my life, not just the games, but also TV shows, movies and toys. The amount of Pokemon merch I own is ridiculous, I mean, did you see the list of games I've played? It's the biggest out of any franchise, and I've sunk tons of hours into them. Additionally, I have numerous Pokemon figures, and probably over a thousand Pokemon cards. That being said, this list is about video games first and foremost, so it's mostly up to them to determine a spot on this list. On that subject, the gameplay of the mainline games is really fun and oddly addicting. I'm not big into RPGs, but Pokemon is one of the exceptions because of my strong connection to the franchise. But I will admit that connection has weakened over time, which is why it's not higher on the list. I've gotten tired of Pokemon plenty of times, like after having played Black for more than 200 hours, Y for almost 200 hours, and after being addicted to Pokemon Go for half a year. There are reasons why I've spent so much time on these games though, one of them being that I love grooming my Pokemon to become the very best that no one ever was, teaching them awesome moves and outplaying cocky trainers. The games are pretty easy once you know about strengths and weaknesses between types, but I still enjoy the loop. I've faced leaks over and over and apparently never gotten bored of them. I also cheated my way through Pokemon Platinum, which I regret in retrospect, but it didn't lessen my enjoyment at the time. I actually got stuck in the distortion world for not having learned strength, but I just cheekily cheated that HM4 to solve the problem. The writing is pretty decent throughout the games, Gen 4 and 5 being particularly interesting, but it's the world and Pokemon themselves that are the most intriguing. They may not be as expressive as they are in the anime, but they're still easily distinguishable, save for some that are almost carbon copies of others. That is understandable though, as there are almost 1000 Pokemon now, so the fact that most of them are so unique and recognizable is amazing. The world design is also really distinctive, even though the regions are based on real-life locations, like the United States, United Kingdom and France, but they still feel like fantasy worlds. Exploring these regions is one of my favorite aspects of the games, and they carry some fascinating lore, often related to legendaries. Speaking of legendaries, finding them always feels so special, even in the games that contain many. They just have this rarity and presence to them that most other Pokemon lack. What's even more special is finding shiny Pokemon, and the only one I've encountered naturally is a pink Sphiel and Emerald, that I later evolved into a Salio and finally Walrein. I said naturally, as I cheated forth several shiny Pokemon in Platinum, one of which I traded for a level 100 Rayquaza in Pokemon Y. I was a bit crazy on that front. 
The soundtracks to these games have always been memorable, and I find a lot of the tracks beautiful. Even the old games sound really cool, despite being composed with simplistic chiptune, but I find bittunes appealing. It has that nostalgic feel to it, same with the Cries of the Pokemon. The games have never looked all that impressive, but there's something charming about their simplicity. The sprites all look cool, and they have decent enough animation. They are on handhelds, so it's not like you can expect AAA graphics from them. The simplistic designs also made it so the jump to 3D was mind-blowing, and even though X and Y were underwhelming Pokemon games, I still sunk almost 200 hours into Y, as I couldn't get enough of its fresh look. Overall, the games are really fun, but also very formulaic, with each game being nearly identical to the last. Hell, there are always multiple versions of the same exact game each generation, only they feature exclusive Pokemon, which annoys the hell out of me. It made sense in the past when trading between systems was a new concept, but now it just feels like the company is deliberately ripping people off. Considering how underwhelming the newer games are despite being on much superior hardware has basically confirmed that, especially since Game Freak is now putting out pay DLC. I know they're always on time constraints, since Pokemon is more of a corporate entity for consumers than a passion product for fans, and that's a damn shame. It's ironic how a series about evolution has barely evolved at all, if not regressed, and I won't care much for the series unless it improves greatly, which it probably won't, since the games continue to sell like hotcakes. Give us something closer to Pokemon Breath of the Wild, and I'm sure the dissatisfied fans will be happy. Aside from some of my closer friends, I doubt that anyone saw this one coming, even though I mentioned my love for it a few times before. This is by far my favorite racing game series, and that comes down to the fact that it's not solely focused on racing. It has a larger emphasis on open world driving, which I find more appealing than repeatedly racing laps around courses. That can still be found in these games, but there's otherwise so much freedom to experiment. I love traveling from one point of the map to another, and there are two maps in the sequel, making for even more free roam. Because of that, along with crisper graphics, better missions, and more up-to-date cars, the sequel is my favorite of the two, even though the lack of certain cars baffles me, especially Lamborghinis that even the original had. The Aventador came out around this time, goddammit, that's one of my favorites. Also, I have to admit that my favorite activity in the series is to deliver people's cars in the original. It was pretty much a game changer, since you had to drive at least somewhat responsibly to keep them in peak condition. That's how you got the greatest rewards, that were always more than $100,000, which made you rich fast. I can't really say whether the graphics are good or not, but they're definitely not the best. Facial animations are a bit iffy, but they often are in open world games to be fair. I do like how the games look though, and the car models look clean as hell. Until I dirty them, of course. I remember I was pretty impressed by the enhanced details in the sequel, especially on the roads. There's also a lot of customization for not only cars, but also houses and even your own appearance. That last one requiring plastic surgery, funnily enough. Sexy car washes is another nice touch. The radio stations are nice too, but the best sounds come from the cars themselves. Actually, the voice acting might be better, if only for being hilariously bad. I think TDU is quite underrated, but I do understand why it's not popular, and even I wouldn't put it any higher on the list, no matter how much I enjoy it. I was going to place it higher initially, but then I realized something. This series lacks identity. With its bland story and one-dimensional characters that have no other trait than being annoying rivals. Sure, that makes beating them satisfying, but there have been far better rivals. The series also only has two games, so that's another reason why it's only at number 9, which is still really high to be fair, as these are my favorite video game franchises. Maybe it would have been higher if the crew was TDU3, but that's more of a spiritual successor, like Ukulele is to Banjo-Kazooie. That being said, I still love these games, having some incredibly fun gameplay, and I would very much welcome an actual test drive in Limited 3. It's a bit odd to include something that's not exactly known for being a game series, but I just couldn't pass this one up. South Park is one of my favorite TV shows ever, for its endearing cast, hilarious comedy, and simply yet effective art style. All of that can be found in its games, at least the ones published by Ubisoft, those being the stick of truth and the fractured butthole. 
I do prefer the gameplay of Test Drive Unlimited, but I have a stronger connection to South Park, and these are by far the most faithful licensed games I've ever played. Not only that, but these games are also some of the best content South Park has ever produced, being better than most episodes, seasons, and the movie. They're kind of like seasons of the show themselves, except you actually get to play them, and they have overarching plots. Those aren't favored in the show, but they work a lot better in game form than the completely story-driven season 20, for instance. The Stick of Truth story is definitely the strongest, but overall, I find both games equally well written. I prefer the humor in The Fractured But Whole. That title says it all, really. It also has more fan service, which I appreciate as a South Park fan. The characters are all in character, being just as charming and hilarious as ever. I love the kids' try-hard attitudes pretending to be superhero and fantasy archetypes, as well as their banter between one another, both of which are present even during combat. The presentation of both games is fantastic, and as accurate to the show as can be. The character models, environments, and animations look exactly like they should, and given that they're considerably new, they're some of the best South Park has ever looked. Just look at these ultimate moves from the Fractured Butthole, they're so clean. I also appreciate all the easter eggs that reference the show, the games are filled to the brim with such details. The soundtrack is surprisingly great, being really epic in the stick of truth, and the Fractured Butthole has a varied one. The Racin's Girls theme sounds very reminiscent of the Powerpuff Girls, which I find quite amusing. The voice acting is on point as usual, and it's always impressed me how the two creators of South Park voice almost every character. Sure, most of them sound similar, but it's still easy to distinguish them regardless. The gameplay is not some of the best I've played, but it's solid in both. It is very simplistic in the stick of truth, but it still works due to the hilarity of the characters and their moves. Take Hartman's Curse for example, where his V-chip activates so that he saps enemies by constantly swearing. That's a reference to my favorite scene in the movie, and might be the best fucking move in the motherfucking games. Ouch. The class system is a neat touch as well. I went as a thief the first time, which felt badass, and then I obviously had to try out the Jew class, which led to some uh, interesting moves and costumes. The Fractured Buttholes gameplay is a lot more fleshed out, featuring even more classes and being able to mix superpowers from them. Having a wider area to move around in combat makes strategizing so much more compelling, and some battles have stage hazards, which made the fights even more engaging. They could be quite challenging, especially bosses like Kyle's cousin Kyle, or Michael Jackson from the Casa Bonita DLC. That was a really fun DLC by the way, partly because Casa Bonita was the centerpiece in one of the best episodes of the show. All that being said, I'm not the biggest fan of RPGs, so I don't exactly love the gameplay of either game, which is one of the reasons why South Park isn't higher on this list. There's also the fact that there are only two games, only two amazing ones anyway, so I'm really hoping there will be more. I've loved the fantasy and superhero themes they've gone with, and if a new game eventually gets made, I want it to be ninja themed, or maybe pirate themed. I'll take anything as long as it's good. Alright, I did claim that South Park has the most faithful licensed games ever, and The Fractured Butthole is my favorite licensed game ever, but I've played far more games from the LEGO series, many of them being almost on par with the South Park games. Nostalgia also plays a part, as I got into LEGO games before I was old enough to appreciate South Park. Not to mention that LEGOs were my favorite toys, and Star Wars, not to mention Indiana Jones were some of my favorite movie franchises. All that compacted into one made for some of the most fun games of my childhood. It started with LEGO Island, but my memory of it is hazy, as I only played them in the early 2000s, but I remember those games having semi-open worlds to explore, which I liked quite a bit. Also, their intros after booting them up were dope. I'll be focusing more on the licensed LEGO games that parody movies, and the way they incorporate those movies is brilliant. They feature condensed scenes of iconic movie moments, packed with charming gags that don't even require voice acting. That is until a certain point where the games actually started implementing voice acting from the movies, which I'm not really a fan of. The series' voices don't fit the animations at all, not in a funny way either. It's just dull and cringeworthy. It was a pretty big turnoff while playing LEGO Star Wars The Force Awakens, and that's the main reason I haven't gotten LEGO The Lord of the Rings or The Avengers, even though those are some of my favorite movie franchises. From collecting studs to building things, or crumbling into pieces, I love how LEGO-like the sound design is. The licensed games make great use of sounds from the movies they're based on, not to mention that there are some meme-worthy death noises, like Yoda's <coughs> Django Fett's <coughs> and the classic <coughs> which is basically the Wilhelm scream of LEGO games. 
I did only mention LEGO Star Wars stuff, because that's the biggest reference I have for sounds, but I do vividly remember this particular noise from LEGO Indiana Jones. Don't ask why. There are also music tracks ripped straight from the movies, which might seem lazy, but they're great soundtracks that create the proper tones, so I can't complain. The LEGO aesthetic really does make for some unique visuals, like scattered pieces, building something out of such pieces, and dank dance moves. It is weird that some surfaces are LEGOs, while others are not, but having everything be LEGOs would look gross, I suppose. There are always so many character models in these licensed games, and almost every LEGO rendition of the movie characters look on point. Despite being majorly simplified, you can even design your own, and decide what weapon it uses. I've gone over what makes these games so goddamn charming, but what about the gameplay? It depends on the type of LEGO games, as well as what characters you use, but the gameplay is generally great, and the variety of characters means that there's at least one for everyone. In LEGO Star Wars, I definitely prefer using the Force users, since, well, they can use the Force, and they have lightsabers that can deflect bullets, and generally look really cool. I like playing as the other characters too, especially in free play, where you can switch between characters to accomplish different tasks throughout levels. When it comes to LEGO Indiana Jones, I obviously prefer using the titular character, as I believe he's the only one carrying a whip, plus he has the coolest demeanor. As for LEGO Island, I think you can only play as one character, but he had a nice moveset consisting of throwing pizzas and skating. Vehicles come in spades throughout these games, ranging from motorcycles to speeder bikes and planes to spaceships, again depending on the movies they're based on. But even LEGO Star Wars has the most mundane vehicles, like cars and freaking tractors. These are easy to find in LEGO City, which is a bonus world in LEGO Star Wars that I often revisited, as it was super satisfying to get tons of studs from destroying everything. The vehicles control really well by the way, and the opening to Revenge of the Sith is one of my favorite levels. I'm looking forward to LEGO Star Wars The Skywalker Saga, even if it does contain the Ratchet sequel trilogy, not to mention voice acting. It'll still be interesting to see how this remake slash continuation turns out, and I haven't really played a new LEGO game for real since The Clone Wars, which might have marked the end for mute characters, sadly. This is perhaps my most interesting entry as I didn't play a single Zelda game until 2013, that being Ocarina of Time for the 3DS, which I wasn't a big fan of initially and took me almost 5 years to finish. It also took me nearly 5 years to finish Majora's Mask 3D, which I finished in January of this year in fact. Even so, I've grown to really appreciate the series, and that appreciation began in 2014 with The Wind Waker HD. I got it for my birthday that year, along with the Wii U, and I finished it within the year. Despite its length, I replayed it shortly after, which goes to show just how much I loved it. I think my newfound appreciation for the series stems from how impressive they are for their time. Like, compare Ocarina of Time to Spyro, or any other game from 1998, and I can see why it got titled the best game of all time. I myself don't think it is, and it's actually my least favorite out of the ones I've finished, which doesn't include A Link Between Worlds. That game's fine by the way, I just couldn't get into it. Something the series does well is the writing, which is also impressive given that ideas are often recycled. Ocarina of Time is great world building that actually changes when you go forwards and backwards through time. The fight with Ganondorf has a suspenseful build up, and Zelda being chic must have been a mind blowing revelation back in the day. The Wind Waker perfects the Triforce storyline, featuring a more interesting Ganondorf who's calm and collected, and Hyrule being drowned is a cool continuity detail. Breath of the Wild is the least interesting, but it tells its story well enough, with some likeable new characters. Majora's Mask is the most unique by far, with a 3 day time limit that makes for some of gaming's most impactful moments that you can relive over and over. What's especially powerful is the final 6 hours, which features the conclusion of the longest, most satisfying quest to reunite a lost couple. It's a sad fact that no matter how many great deeds you perform through tireless dedication, it'll always reset. That is until you finish the game, making it all worthwhile. The presentation of the games is terrific, and surprisingly varied considering how much is reused throughout the games. The same characters show up in different games, and sometimes they're even renamed, like Malon slash Romani in the N64 games, but that doesn't really detract from anything. I used to think it did, along with the repeated storylines and reused music, but it brings a sense of familiarity, and is a clever way to save resources. I liked being able to recognize the character models going from Ocarina of Time to Majora's Mask. Those are obviously the games that look the most alike, as they were made with the same engine, and Majora's Mask had time constraints so it makes sense. 
I also like seeing Beetle in Breath of the Wild, even though he's originally from Wind Waker. Speaking of those two games, they definitely differentiate the most in terms of art style, especially Wind Waker that has one of the most beautiful art styles I've ever seen. Cell shading just works so well for it, and the game oozes with personality. Toon Link's animations makes him one of my favorite video game protagonists, and he doesn't even talk. The music tunes, whether reused or not, are great and fit the series so well. The only soundtrack I don't like that much is Breath of the Wild since it's basically non-existent and is kind of underwhelming whenever it does play. Stellar main theme though. The series is very reliant on music, as ocarinas and the baton are treated as MacGuffins in some of the games and they play some very soothing themes that you'll hear over and over but I rarely got tired of them. What's interesting about Zelda's gameplay is that while the older games have better puzzles and dungeon designs, the later games have better combat and exploration. Part of why Ocarina of Time is my least favorite of the four Zelda games I finished is because of its weak combat, and Hyrule Field was pretty empty for its size. Termina from Majora's Mask on the other hand is far more compact and intriguing, making that map fun to explore. I will admit Majora's combat is just as weak as its predecessors, but I have many other reasons for preferring that game. Majora surely has the best puzzle and dungeon designs in the whole series, despite some badly aged designs here and there. Being able to flip Stone Tower Temple for example was a confusing, but ingenious gimmick. I think I slightly prefer that game over Breath of the Wild, despite that game's superior combat and exploration. I don't even mind the destructible weapons, because there are so many different weapons you can pick up and use, which adds to the variety. The sheer openness of the game also allows for some wonderful exploration, which didn't bother me unlike Hyrule Field, since there's so much to interact with, along with better traversal options. Wind Waker's openness is less, but I love sailing the Great Sea and discovering new locations. Wind Waker has by far my favorite combat, as it's quick, smooth and somewhat challenging, unlike in the N64 games. Even though Breath of the Wild is the freest and most relaxing Zelda to play, it's also the hardest by far, which did get annoying at times, but I prefer that over cakewalks. Judging by my list, I haven't played that many Zelda games, and while I don't care for the 2D games or spin-offs, I should try out Twilight Princess and Skyward Sword at some point. I'll definitely get Breath of the Wild 2, and whatever else 3D Zelda has to offer in the future. Ah yes, Rayman, one of the series I've talked about the most on this channel. Like, Legends was number 3 in my 2D games countdown, my longest review is of Hoodlum Havoc, and I even came up with a moveset for him in Smash Bros, which I won't stop fighting for. Rayman doesn't have the most fleshed out or complex world out there, but it's one of the most imaginative I've seen. Rayman's design alone just screams creativity, and the worlds breathe with wackiness. The art style in Origins and Legends is incredible, and they have so much personality packed into them for being 2D, with smooth and expressive animations. Hoodlum Havoc is jaw-dropping for its time, with some of the most unique levels I've seen, especially the funky board sections that unsurprisingly play funky beats. The snowboard section has a really entrancing track as well. In fact, the whole soundtrack is amazing, and one of my absolute favorites. It contains so many tunes, and yet most of them are top-notch. I love the calmness of the themes from the Fairy Council, the Land of the Livid Dead, and the Summit Beyond the Clouds, and the ominous tones heard in the Bog of Murk, Desert of the Canaran, and Hoodlum Headquarters. While not as good, the soundtracks are great in both Origins and Legends as well, and Legends even has some musical stages that sync up with your movement. Despite its horrid voice acting, Rayman 2 also has some soothing tracks, so these games are practically flawless in that regard. They're not as flawless in regards to gameplay, maybe except for Legends, as that's one of the most polished games I've ever played. The 2D games have basically perfected 2D platforming, with fast traversal and smooth platforming challenges. The amount of moves Rayman and his companions can pull off is pretty wild for a 2D game. It's almost as if it could be added to Smash or something. Hoodlum Havoc's gameplay is very flawed, with bad camera controls and halting double jumps, but I still love it so much, and it's one of my favorite games largely due to its fun as hell gameplay. It also has really good platforming challenges, plus the combat is super intuitive, with a lock-on mode that comes in real handy. Rayman is literally throwing fists, like he's from the hood, and he looks so fly in his various outfits. Those aren't just for show either, as they give you some really fun power-ups that are scattered all throughout the game. Collecting isn't that necessary in most of the games, but it's still addicting, and you can unlock some cool things with them, like costumes in the 2D games and minigames in Hoodlum Havoc. Most of the minigames are nothing to write home about, but they're nice rewards nonetheless. 
In Legends specifically, you can even unlock levels from Origins that have been remade to suit Legends playstyle, which is amazing for me, as I couldn't enjoy Origins designs fully. The writing is mostly minimal throughout the series, but I like some of the funny gags in Origins and Legends, like taking a photo or dancing after completing a level, or even making music out of torturing villains. 2 and 3 focus more on the plot, and although The Great Escape slash Revolution is super cheesy and straightforward, I can't deny that Rayman choosing greed in Cave of Bad Dreams leads to one of the funniest gags in the series. Hoodlum Havoc's storyline is also simple and silly, but effective, with hilarious jokes and lovable characters. Rayman is one of my favorite quiet protagonists, I just love his mannerisms, and Globox is endearing too. My favorite character though has to be Murphy, he was only in the first level, but he left such a good impression, cracking jokes and referencing pop culture. His last line See you in Rayman 4. was unfortunate though. I used to have Rayman at number 3, but to be honest I only truly love two games in the series. Sure, I really like Origins, but not as much, and I'm not that fond of the rest. Still, 5th place is absolutely nothing to scoff at, and I am rooting for this underdog to get the right treatment he deserves. Fuck the rabbits, the countless ports and mobile games, and Ubisoft for not acknowledging Rayman's anniversaries. Michel Ansel said he might return to Rayman after Beyond Good and Evil 2 is over, and I really hope he does. I welcome another amazing 2D game, but another 3D game could bump the franchise back up to 3rd place again. It's incredibly cliché to include Super Mario in a favorite video game franchise list, but I can't deny how good some of its games are, and the series literally has games for everyone. Of course, there's the main series of 2D and 3D platformers, racing games, RPG games, party games, and a whole lot more. Like the majority, I prefer the main platformers, but that's not to say the others aren't good. I really like the racing in Mario Kart, that have some of the most iconic power-ups, and are among the few games I've consistently played together with friends. Mario platformers have fantastic game design, Super Mario World not having aged a day after almost 30 years. That's not even my favorite Mario game anymore, as Super Mario Odyssey won me over. It probably won't age as well as World, as 2D games are a lot easier to perfect than 3D games, but in terms of 3D, Odyssey is one of the most polished games I've played. That's very impressive considering one of its main gimmicks is controlling others, which usually doesn't work well. Super Mario Galaxy has some great controls as well, with creative physics, although I will admit those physics sometimes detract from the overall experience. Another 2D game I really liked was New Super Mario Bros. I used to replay its final level, pretty much speedrunning it a dozen times. That game also came with some cool minigames, ranging from cards to deathmatches and even collecting coins for Wario. Super Mario Flash was another game of my childhood where I could create my own Mario levels, and that got perfected in Super Mario Maker 1 and 2 that are some of the best creation games out there. The Mario games have some of the most colorful and varied environmental designs out there, with bouncy mushroom worlds, musical race courses, toy land, and a kingdom made from food. I didn't give an example from Super Mario World, as I've realized it's one of the least imaginative Mario games out there. There aren't many different level types, they often get reused, and even the music is just different variations of the same theme. It's still a wonderful game, and I guess old games had such restrictions inherently, so that's a shame. My favorite games visually are Galaxy and Odyssey, Galaxy having those stellar space aesthetics, including visible faraway moons that come in various shapes and sizes. Odyssey has a bit of that too in its moon level, which is cool, but what I love about Odyssey's visuals is that the locations are so unique and varied. There's a spooky first level with a calming atmosphere, a place called New Donk City that holds the flashiest festival, and Bowser's Castle is more like a dojo this time, with some artistic backgrounds. The music in the games is somewhat generic, but still really good, especially in Odyssey, which has such a catchy main theme that fits the game so well. The sound design is generally satisfying, especially Galaxy that has noises coming straight from the Wiimote. Such music to my ears. There's not much to say about the writing, as there's barely any aside from saving Peach from Bowser, but it was made more interesting in Odyssey, having world details that promote Bowser and Peach's wedding, and the ending had a really funny twist. Super Mario Galaxy did something interesting too by introducing Rosalina and the Lumas that have some interesting lore to them. Looking at the list of Mario games I've played, it looks like i played a lot, but I haven't even scratched the surface compared to how many Mario games there actually are. There are so many potential gems I haven't tried, like the Super Mario Bros. Trilogy, 64, Sunshine, and even Galaxy 2. Despite missing some important releases, the franchise has been a big part of my life, which is the case for most gamers I bet. 
I don't know what comes next for the series, but I'd gladly welcome a Super Mario Odyssey 2, which doesn't seem out of the question, since Nintendo did make a sequel to Galaxy, and are now doing a sequel for Breath of the Wild. The 2D Mario games are kind of obsolete at this point, what with two Super Mario makers, but maybe they can surprise in that field as well. Entering top 3 is my favorite Nintendo franchise, which just so happens to be the ultimate Nintendo franchise, as it pits the most iconic Nintendo mascots up against each other. Much like Rayman, Super Smash Bros. is another franchise I've covered a bunch on my channel, obviously including the Rayman for Smash video. Smash also gained the top spot in two of my countdowns, and placed second in another. I haven't played many other fighting games, so I'm not completely sure whether I'd love the more traditional ones, but they seem tame in comparison, because they lack freedom. Yeah, yeah, I've heard they have some complicated inputs and whatnot, but I mean more in the sense of stage scale and being able to freely move within them. That's something Smash excels at, and it also has the advantage of containing iconic characters. It's what made me familiar with all these Nintendo franchises, and although I haven't gotten into most of them, I do acknowledge Nintendo's strong legacy, and I wouldn't have discovered the Amazing Zelda franchise until later had I not gotten Brawl. Because of the amalgamation of various IPs, this game boasts a giant roster of not only characters, but also stages, that all have their own unique designs and animations, and are filled to the brim with details and references to the franchises they represent. This also means that the games have some of the biggest soundtracks in gaming, Ultimate containing almost 1000 different tracks, and is bound to reach that point eventually, with all the DLC fighters coming out. You can tell that Sakurai and crew truly care about making a satisfactory product, which is unfortunately kind of rare for major developers in this day and age. These games are pretty much endless, so it's quite a test to fully explore their content. On that topic, I feel like I've underutilized their potential, since I mostly just fight competitively without items, which I'm not even all that good at, but it's fun to pretend that I am. I do love modes with items too, but they often lead to random results, although to be fair, that's part of the fun, similar to the highly luck based Mario Kart and Party. Smash was intended to be a party game after all, and what a party it is. Not every character is fun to play as, and some of them are broken in the metagame, but since there are so many different fighters to choose from, any player is bound to find at least one fighter they're compatible with, and I can name more than a dozen characters that I love to play as. Other modes outside of regular fighting can be really fun too, such as Smash Run in the 3DS version, which was a bit reminiscent of Subspace Emissary in Brawl. Speaking of that single player mode, I love it so damn much. Are some of the enemies and level designs annoying? Yes, but it's a great adventure, especially playing it alongside a friend, and the cutscenes are outstanding. That's why World of Light and Ultimate was disappointing, as it lacked such cutscenes, but it was still really fun. It had some awesome boss battles, even though I wish Taboo was among them, as that is one of the best final bosses I've faced, especially on intense mode. Another thing that's amazing about Smash Bros, and is part of the reason I placed this franchise over titans like Rayman and Super Mario, is that the time leading up to a new game is just as fun and exciting as playing the games themselves. Seriously, I'm always incredibly excited to watch newcomer reveals at the end of Nintendo Directs leading up to a Smash release, or even DLC characters after, which is an exciting process we're currently in. If there aren't any big Mario or Zelda games being showcased, then Smash news is usually the only thing I look forward to in those Directs, unless something else of note pops up, but that's pretty rare. It's also extremely entertaining to see those reaction videos to big reveals. Etika was the prime example of that, and it's such a shame that he's gone now, as he was my favorite YouTuber. A couple of my shitposts feature the clip of him reacting to Snake in Smash Ultimate, which is a perfect meme template, as it's just so priceless. He always knew how to brighten the mood, and I'm so sad that he's gone. It's been exactly one year since his passing, which is why I decided to upload this video today, in commemoration of the Iceman. Joy-Con boys forever, man. Joy-Con boys forever. This is a franchise I haven't talked about quite as much as some of the others on this list, but I have continually expressed my love for it, and love it I do, as it gets silver in the competition for my favorite video game franchises, which fits Slice Color. I played these games in a pretty strange order. It started with a demo of Band of Thieves back in the mid-2000s, which compelled me to get the full experience shortly after, and it was incredible. It's still one of my 10 favorite video games, even including multiple entries. I got Honor Among Thieves maybe a year later, but I barely played it, and I'm not sure why. 
Sly 4 was such a surprise reveal I just had to get, as it looked super fun from the trailers. Despite its bad writing, it actually became my favorite in the series, with such fun gameplay and a beautiful presentation. I finally got into the original and revisited Honor Among Thieves when I got the HD collection back in late 2013. The first game has aged surprisingly well, and I really like it. Sly 3 on the other hand has not aged that well, considering it was Sucker Punch's last entry, and the fact that I had played a bit of it during my childhood, and yet, it felt weird to play. Its development was rushed, so I guess that's the reason, and might explain why I barely played it initially. Something all these games nail, however, is the presentation. Well, the first game's animations are underwhelming, which is understandable given that Sucker Punch didn't have much of a budget to make it flourish, but even so, they made a smart decision going for a cel shaded look. Not only that, but the levels are distinct, and while a lot of them are dark, they're also plenty colorful. I love the comic book styled cutscenes too, even though the art is a tad rough. Sly 2 upped the presentation by a long shot, and Sly 3 looks just as good if not better. Sly 4 being a much newer game looks really beautiful, and I like the cartoony cutscenes it went for. The soundtracks aren't among my favorites, but I can't deny how essential they are for creating the fantastic atmosphere of the games. A lot of it consists of jazz, which I'm a fan of, as it's very relaxing to listen to, and perfectly fits stealth-oriented games like Sly. I must also give a shout out to the brilliant sound design, like the pronounced footsteps when walking within a guard's vicinity. Gotta love the cartoony effects when whacking enemies too, it all feels so authentic. It's funny how such an action-packed genre like platforming works so well in tandem with stealth, where you're supposed to be sneaky, but Sly Cooper balances them so effortlessly. The first game is very different from the others, as it has linear level design instead of hub worlds, but they work really well. It can be compared to Crash Bandicoot, but I find Sly 1 so much more enjoyable. The level design is very neat and tidy, and there's no problem collecting all clue bottles within a stage. The game does suffer a bit from its emphasis on minigames, but I do like a lot of them, even the driving, which is universally hated. I don't like the Murray Escort missions, however, nor a majority of the Russian episode, which mainly consists of minigames. The climbing mission before the final boss is pretty great, though. Sly 2 minimizes the minigames, allowing for a much better experience, but I do admit the game is a bit too long, having many repeated mission types, and the whole game takes about 15 hours to complete. Also, whenever minigames do show up, they're terrible. I hate turret missions, and the tank controls are even worse offenders. That being said, Sly 3 has it worst by far, having loads of minigames, most of them being annoying. It also has playable side characters, and while the Guru is fine to play as, the others are not, save for in a few cases. In contrast, the main trio plays really well, and do in fact get improvements as the series continues. Sly 3 also commits the worst sin of combining an escort mission with a turret section, which is part of why I think China might be the worst episode in the entire series. I do mostly love the Holland chapter though, and the Cooper Vault is the best mission in the whole series, so at least Sly 3 has that going for it. I have almost no qualms with Sly 4's gameplay, maybe aside from a lack of challenge, but its fun factor makes up for it. Almost every minigame is super enjoyable, and while the use of 6 axes is questionable, it's not so bad, since it's used sparingly for brief segments. Overall, I mostly love the gameplay of the series, but to me, Sly 4 is pretty much the only one that's flawless in that regard. The original Sly trilogy has some pretty impressive writing considering its genre, that usually emphasizes gameplay. Sly still focuses heavily on gameplay, as well as every other facet, which is why they're such well-rounded experiences. The writing does contain some wackiness, like sudden ghosts, hate chips, and evil masks, but they're integrated so nonchalantly that they don't bug me too much. The first game was really interesting, as it set up Sly's tragic backstory that led him on the path of thievery along with his friends. He's still quite honorable though, since he chooses to only steal from criminals. The Fiendish Five is a pretty badass name for a villain group, and while not all of them stand out, Mugshot, Panicking, and especially Clockwork are striking opponents. Clockwork's whole motivation is just so sinister, turning himself into machinery so he can continue to exact revenge upon the Cooper family. I swear, that's some then after death shit. Even after defeating him, his presence is still there, his parts being scattered all over the world in the hands of by far the best villain group, the Claw Gang. The members of this gang all work in tandem, despite not seeming that way until near the end of the game, but when the plan does get revealed, it's crazy to find out just how interconnected the story was to begin with. Neela is on par with Clockwork, being just as conniving, repeatedly backstabbing everyone. The development for the Cooper gang is also a highlight, Bentley becoming a lot braver after being forced to embark on missions alone, and Murray feeling like he lets down his friends, which is elaborated on in the next game. 
the final cutscene is one of my favorite endings in gaming, as it's fun, hard-hitting, and most of all game-changing. Forgive me for sounding cliché, but it's basically The Empire Strikes Back of Sly Cooper. Despite my faults with Honor Among Thieves, it did a wonderful job concluding the trilogy storyline, and it brought some genius dialogue. I did find Bentley's skepticism towards Sly to be forced and rushed, but it's not a big problem overall. Sly 4 has far more writing problems, like destroying Sly and Carmelita's relationship, making Sly overly sarcastic, and of course, Penelope turning into a villain for idiotic reasons. I also have to mention that it ended on a damn cliffhanger, and we still haven't gotten a Sly 5 after 7 years. I thought for sure we wouldn't be waiting as long as the break between 3 and 4, but alas, it seems we have to wait even longer, if it even happens at all. Along with Rayman 4, Sly 5 is for sure the sequel I want the most. That's right, my favorite franchise of all time is Ratchet and & Clank, and there's no competition, even if I add movies or TV shows to the equation. It is true that RMC is far from the most consistent franchise, taking some rather unfavorable risks along the way, but nothing will ever top its peaks for me. Five of the games are my favorite games of all time, and three others are part of the top 20. I even revisit the games I don't like nearly as much, and still find enjoyment in them. Well, at least the games made by Insomniac, as I've never actually finished any of the other four. So, what makes me love this series so goddamn much? My history certainly plays a part in it, as the original Ratchet & Clank might have been the first game I ever played, and even if it wasn't, it most certainly left the biggest impression. I think what's most consistently great about the series is the gameplay. Sure, it does falter in some of them, but the mainline games are all incredible in that regard, with smooth movement, interesting game design and lots of variety. RNC is well known for its vast arsenal of weapons, as many of them are creative, explosive and generally satisfying to use. There are some dull ones, but there are far more awesome weapons that are so damn fun and addictive. Part of that addiction stems from the innovative nanotech leveling up system, in which weapons will gain experience depending on how much they're used. You really feel like a badass warrior as you progress through the games, upping your arsenal, your health and buying stronger armors. It's a satisfying game loop that never ceases to entertain me, which is evident by my record of having replayed 5 of the games about 30 times each. That's pretty insane, considering my maximum for other games is around 5 playthroughs. The series also sports some entertaining minigames, or maxi games as Insomnia calls them, which include stunning space battles, small spherical moons that were kind of innovative at the time, accelerating hoverboard slash hoverbike races, and last but not least, arena battles, which got so popular that an entire game focused focused on gladiatorial combat. I'm of course referring to Ratchet Deadlocked, or more appropriately named Gladiator, which might have the best combat in the series, but it did leave some things to be desired in terms of exploration. That's where most of the other RNCs come into play, as they have really engaging explorative elements, especially A Crack in Time, which features big worlds filled with collectibles, in addition to open world space sectors where you can visit moons to find even more collectibles. That game also has the best Clank gameplay, which isn't bad in the other games, but they're certainly pace breakers. The game's controls feel so good overall, and many much appreciated quality of life improvements have been added throughout the franchise's run. The gameplay might worsen, but it'll still be improved all the same. A big reason why the gameplay works so well has to do with the brilliant atmosphere of the games, each game featuring vibrant visuals in a multitude of colors. There are so many unique environments to visit, like the iconic bustling city of Metropolis that has been overrun by nature, the prehistoric planet Sargasso that inhabits gigantic dinosaurs, and the technologically advanced Great Clock that is a true sight to behold. Even the developers know how beautiful the games look, as the player is always presented with a panorama view of each place they visit, my favorite of these probably being Planet Yidl, because of the menacing Megacorp factory towering over you amidst all that darkness surrounding it, which is so fitting for a final level. Exploring these locations always feels so satisfying, and it was cool seeing locations from the first game remade for the current generation. It is a shame some of them got left out, such as the entrancing Gimlik base, but it's already amazing in the original, so I guess it's not a big loss. 
I'd say the original probably nailed atmosphere the best, and it also has some fluid and expressive animations. The voice acting certainly helps, which is usually top tier, especially for the four main characters. On the topic of audio, the soundtracks are some of my favorites, particularly during the PS2 era. Those tracks are so insanely cool and unique, having lots of badass music like Rilgar and Bolden, and some that are simply electronic beauties like the Obani Moons. The composer for those soundtracks, David Bershow, changed his tone for Tools of Destruction and Quest for Booty, which is kind of a shame, but they still sound pretty good. Boris Salchow gave a crack in time a surprisingly good soundtrack, even though it's very low key, but it's definitely better than whatever Michael Bross has been putting out for the remaining titles. Not that those are bad per se, they're just kinda dull, and aren't the ideal soundtracks aren't seen needs. The aspect that probably falters the most in Ratchet & Clank is the writing, as each generation of the franchise has very different writing styles. I love the simplistic and comedic writing of the PS2 era, where every single character has the ability to be at least somewhat funny, and the best characters are absolutely hilarious. Captain Quark and Dr. Nefarious in particular come to mind regarding hilarity, and they're some of my favorites because of that. There are also intimidating characters like Chairman Drek and Gleeman Vox, cheeky characters like Lawrence and Dallas, and even some interesting ones, like Ratchet for his development in the first game, not to mention Captain Quark's redemption arc that gets resolved by the end of the trilogy. The jokes often land, especially in Going Commando and Up Your Arsenal, that are probably the two funniest games I've ever played. I mean, their names say it all, being cleverly done sexual innuendos, and most of the other RNC games also have such titles. Quest for Booty is particularly spicy, and speaking of the future series, it has some wonderful moments that made me as a diehard RNC fan really happy, but I can't deny that it started the series derailment. The amount of new lore added by TJ Fixman led to some fascinating new opportunities, but retcons sadly had to be made in order to actually exploit them. That being said, A Crack in Time is genuinely one of my favorite stories in gaming, in spite of its many retcons, over-explanations, and non-conclusive ending. The returning characters are honestly not too far from their peaks, and the overall humor works really well despite the post-PS2 games not being anywhere near as funny. Asimuth is probably the most interesting character in the series, and brings some fascinating lore regarding the Lombaxes. Reclaiming Clank was also super satisfying, and the ending never fails to melt my heart. If only we could get moments like those again, but the games after are sadly lacking. Not even Into the Nexus could satisfy me, claiming to be an epilogue to the future series, but not really doing anything of worth, and ended on a damn cliffhanger which still hasn't been resolved after six and a half years. The PS4 game is the worst offender, however, as it rewrote the entire origin and basically trampled all over it, with unfunny jokes and an awful pace that even the movie managed to set straight. I therefore worry for future installments in the series, since the writing hasn't been up to par for so long, and the tone has changed so drastically. I still look forward to new releases, they'll excite me no matter what, but I hope Insomnia can produce something better, which they should be able to do now that they've become a first party PlayStation developer. Hopefully the next game will continue the search for the Lombaxes, so that Ratchet & Clank fans can get a proper conclusion to that storyline at last. I've been bashing the franchise for quite a bit, but that's because I hold it in high regard. I still love it immensely, as its high points mean so much to me. Five of them are my absolute favorite games, after all. I said in my last week's video that I would dedicate a set of videos to whichever franchise that won, so I'll be doing a Ratchet & Clank month, and what better month to use than the one where it all began, and where some later RNCs also released, that being November. Here's my plan. I will post a video every week within that month, making up four RNC themed videos, which obviously starts on November 4th, as that's when the original RNC came out. That'll be the franchise's 18th anniversary, finally reaching adulthood, so that's pretty exciting. I'll produce the videos beforehand, since they'll require a lot of time and effort, but I'll still release them according to the schedule. I gotta have time to do my favorite franchise justice, that's what made this video so hard to make, and it will no doubt be a difficult task to execute this RNC month I have in mind. I've not entirely decided on what topics I will do for two of the videos yet, so I'll give further details on my plan in the future, probably in October, so look forward to that. Since I've now revealed my favorite games, I can be a lot more open about them, especially Ratchet & Clank. Fear not though, as I will still make videos about plenty of other stuff as well, it's just that I'll make more content on stuff I wouldn't do before, which is at least exciting to me. Before I end this video, it's time to reveal the winner of the guessing contest. The user whose guess was most accurate is... Argadon Lumanus. Nah, just kidding, but it would've been amazing if the hit channel won. The actual winner is... The Raccoonus Show! To think that the first guess would end up being the most correct. You certainly have earned your win.
Congratulations, this means I will dedicate a self-contained video to your channel, where I promote it for more recognition. It might not mean much due to my channel being so small, but you will at least be given special recognition by me, which I hope you appreciate. Thank you all so much for tuning in. This project has been really tough to execute, and I hope you all enjoyed it. Hopefully, you don't hate my choices too much, but I can't account for everyone's opinions. That's why I'd appreciate it if you guys would comment your own favorite video game franchises, and maybe comment on my choices to say whether you agree or disagree with them. Alright, this video has gone on for long enough, so I'll be making my exit now. I'm Arcadon, and please have yourselves a damn good one.